So last time we were talking about the standard model as an effective field theory, and we decided that the power counting would be in this, epsilon, the masses of the particles in the standard model, the scales in the standard model, divided by some new physics scale, scale outside the standard model. And I made the statement that this was connected to operator dimension, but I didn't make that precise, and I want to do that now as the first thing we do today. Let's, let's spend a few minutes and talk about marginal, irrelevant, and relevant operators and their connection to power counting. power counting over and over again, and I'm going to abbreviate it p dot c dot from now on. So let's consider an effective field theory. It'll be a scalar effective field theory. In d dimensions, standard kinetic term, mass term, Phi 4 term, so it'll be a Phi 4 scalar field theory. It'll be an effective theory, so we won't stop there. And I'll just write down up to Phi 6, though in principle I could keep going. So we can look at the dimensions of the various objects here. The action with our units is dimensionless, h bar and c are 1. So the mass dimensions of the field in d dimensions are d minus 2 over 2. Since the dimensions of d dx are minus d, we have to compensate for that, and we have to compensate for the two derivatives. The canonically normalized kinetic term tells us how to no what the dimensions of phi are. And then we can work out the dimensions of everything else, so mass squared dimension 2. tau dimension 6 minus 2d, lambda would be dimension 0, d is 4. OK, so hopefully somewhat familiar stuff. So let's say we want to study a correlation function. Of a bunch of phi's at different space-time points. And we want to look at it at long distance. Long distance is small momenta. So the way I'm going to make the distance long is I'm going to say that all these x's that are appearing in my phi's, x1 through xn, I'm going to redefine them as some s, common parameter, times x prime. And then I'm just going to take s goes to infinity with the x prime fixed. So that makes all the x's large. So when I do that, if I make a redefinition like that, I can mess up the normalization of my kinetic term. It'll no longer be canonical. But I can fix that by just redefining my field. And the way to do that is to do the following. find a new field phi prime that's equal to the old field, but rescaled by an s. And the outcome of that is that we get an action for the phi prime field 
written in terms of prime coordinates, which has a kinetic term, it's the same form. But then S's start showing up in the other places. And if you look at the powers of the S's that are showing up, it's related also to the powers of these parameters. Yeah? Are you sure about the powers of lambda is tau or the dimension of lambda is tau? Did I get it backwards? It would be d minus 4. I think it's from d minus 4, and then the other one's from d minus 6. And no mm. Yeah, that looks right. Oh, you have to be, so let's see. There's D's here, right? So it's not D. You're going to keep. Yeah. I stick by what I wrote. Check it. <laughs> All right. So let's look at the correlation function in terms of the phi prime. Because the phi prime is just a function of x primes, and the x primes are holding fixed. So if we rescale everything in terms of the x primes, then we have some matrix element that's not growing with S, we can make all the S's explicit. So we take our original guy, which in terms of our new variables looks like that. We make this redefinition. We get some powers of S out front. And then we get something. is just in terms of the x primes and won't grow with s. So we could study this in, in various dimensions if we wanted to. Let's for simplicity and also since it's the most common case we're interested in, take d equals 4. I still may write d's, but let's, let's from here on take d equals 4 and ask the question, what happens as s gets large? So now we've made all the S's explicit. This is something that you often do when you're doing effective field theory. If you figure out what the, how, to, how you're going to study the large uh, distance behavior, you want to make the parameter that's controlling that limit explicit so you can see it, so it's not hiding anywhere. And that's what we've done with this algebra. So as S goes to infinity, because we have this explicit S squared there, the M squared term is becoming more and more important. It's called relevant. Tau term is becoming less important. Because if I put in d equals 4, then this is s to the minus 2. It's tracking the s is making it less important as s grows. And the lambda term is equally as important as it was before. And the terminology that goes along with this is an association to, so that was a statement about parameters. We could also make a statement about operators, since obviously they were part of the story here that gave the s factors. So we would say that phi squared is a relevant operator. The phi 4 is marginal. And phi 6 is irrelevant. And you can see, because of the argument that we made, that this was just directly connected to dimension.
and also to the so either to the dimension of the operators or to the dimension of the parameters. Okay, so we're connecting something that we can say, which is the power counting. In this case, we're controlling that with S, using S as our control parameter to look at long distances. And we're seeing that that gets connected to dimensions of operators. Any questions? So let's take S finite, but large. We're not usually we're not interested in taking it all the way to infinity, although we may make it as large as we want to study some long distance behavior. So what I just said is that we can see from the powers of S the importance of the various terms. Relevant terms are more important than marginal terms, and marginal terms are more important than irrelevant terms. The words say it all. <laughs> So that means that if you want to think of how to do the power counting, and you don't want to think of introducing this S, since that was kind of just our choice, we introduced it as a way of thinking about this, this question. But if we went back to the original action, we should have a way of doing the power counting from that without having to do this rescaling. And we know how to do that now. This exercise teaches us that we can just look at mass dimensions of the parameters to do the power counting. So if you just associate a, a power to the parameters, we're still in d equals 4, then we would get this, this association, this being the statement that it's relevant, marginal, and irrelevant. And we could do a power counting in this lambda nu. say in a language which would be familiar from Feynman diagrams where we do everything in momentum space, that the momentum we want to study, P, is mu has to be much less than this lambda nu, and we'll do the power counting in the lambda nu. And that will make the, for example, tau term an irrelevant, less important operator. So there's one comment here. We did the scalar field theory just because it's simplest. It also has a relevant operator. And we see that relevant operators actually can be dangerous. Because we'd like to set the, the power counting for the whole problem by the kinetic term. We'd like to say that the kinetic term, which had, was canonically normalized and had no s's in it, we'd like to say that that was relevant, that that's part of the leading order Lagrangian. But when we went through it, we found something that was more relevant, the mass term, phi squared. It could become even larger, right, than the kinetic term. So we have to be careful about relevant operators. And in this, this is, of course, related to the Higgs fine-tuning. So even though I'm using a scalar field theory, I'm for the most part going to just fine-tune and ignore this problem, since if I was using some fermionic field theory, I could set things up so I could ignore it from the start. But still using a scalar field theory is, is convenient. So I want to also come back to something, that, something else that we mentioned last time and go into a little more detail. And that is the discussion of divergences. So last time, 
we said that there was two different ways of thinking about renormalizability. A traditional sense of renormalizability, renormalizability of the standard model, or an effective field theory way of thinking about renormalizability. So I want to come back to that with our, with our example, this scalar field theory. So let's take, let's get rid of this issue of having something that can upset the power counting, either by taking m to be 0 or just fine-tuning it to be small. And what that means is I just demand that as a s grows, I shrink m. And if I do that, then I can, by hand, tune this term and this term to be the same size. So if you like, I'm assigning a scaling to m in order to make the mass term be always as important as the kinetic term. So with that little proviso, we can start thinking about divergences. And when we start drawing Feynman diagrams, they will generically have divergences. So we could have two four-point interactions, which I label by lambda, because that's, that's the parameter that shows up in the Feynman rule. If this is k and this is some k plus p, then this guy's going to have two powers of lambda, and it's going to be some integral like that. We won't worry about overall factors here. I'm regulating with dimensional regularization. I'll often do that when it's convenient for us. If you ask how this integral diverges, you could ask how it diverges just in terms of thinking about it in terms of some parameter that's controlling the ultraviolet, like a cutoff. So even if I'm using dim reg, I could ask what's, what's the power of the divergence. And it diverges as, in d dimensions, lambda to the d minus 4. So you say d minus 4 is the degree of the divergence. And that's because you have d, power, d powers of k from the measure and minus 4 from the propagators. So if d is equal to 4, you say a degree of divergence is 0, but that means log divergent. So if you take d equals 4 in the UV, 4 powers of k downstairs, d upstairs. But if d is 4, that's 4 upstairs and 4 downstairs. So it's scaling like dk over k. If I made it Euclidean, that's exactly what it would become. And that's like a log. So it's a log of the cutoff. So it's a 1 over epsilon in dim reg. d is 4 minus 2 epsilon. And if you just want to think about what this does, well, it, it, it's something that renormalizes the lambda phi 4 operator. So you need a counter term for the lambda phi 4. So you add to your theory that counter term, and you can get rid of this divergence. OK, so, so far, hopefully, standard stuff. Let's keep going, think about other diagrams. So what if I put in a tau term and a lambda term? This integral is the same integral, I just have different fields on the outside. So it's got the same divergence. But now the operator it's renormalizing is an operator with six points on the outside. We're normalizing the tau phi 6 term. So I insert one tau and one lambda, and I have to get back the renormalization of tau. Well, that's not so bad. We had tau from the start if we include the tau term. So not really a problem from the point of view of a standard renormalization program. But we could also include two taus like this. Again, same integral. So same divergence, 
And now this normalizes something that we haven't included yet, something with eight points, a phi eight operator. So in order to renormalize that diagram and make the theory renormalizable in an effective field theory sense, we need to include the phi 8 operator. So if I ignored the dots that I wrote down, so let me say without the dots, then phi 8 wasn't there. And so then, therefore, we would say the theory is not renormalizable. That's, that's what makes the theory, that's what makes the tau operator, the phi 6 operator, be a non-renormalizable uh, theory in the, in the traditional sense, if we include that operator. That's the classic way of thinking. And the effective theory way of thinking is just that we have to add that operator as soon as this diagram would become relevant. So we just determined a minute ago that tau goes like lambda nu to the minus 2. So tau goes like 1 over lambda nu squared. And in this diagram, we have two powers of tau. So it's even less important, it's lambda nu to the 4 downstairs. And so when, when it becomes relevant to us, we want that kind of accuracy that we want to include things like, that go like 1 over lambda nu to the 4. We have to consider this diagram, and we have to consider adding that operator to the effective theory. And that's the sense in which we say that the theory can be renormalized order by order in its power counting parameter. This one over lambda nu. So at order this order, then you have to add this operator. sense? Good. Silence means that it makes sense. Jumping up and down and saying it doesn't make sense means that it doesn't make sense. Or puzzled looks from everybody, but it's harder to, to discern. So we can summarize this way of thinking in the following way. Remember with the effective theory that we're only interested in computing things to some accuracy. And the accuracy controls where we stop in the series. So if we're interested in stopping at lambda nu to the r, or 1 over s to the r, s was big and lambda nu is also much bigger than the p. But let's stick to talking about lambda nu. And we include all operators that have dimensions up to a certain level. And since the power counting is connected to dimensions, we're kind of guaranteed that we will have everything we need. So as I promised, what this little argument or discussion tells us is how power counting is connected to dimensions. And this is the classic way of thinking about effective field theory is that the power counting is connected to dimensions. 
So this seems pretty generic, actually. You could imagine that if I did scalars, and I mean, fermions and scalars, or gauge theory, then I could still go through the same type of arguments, write down higher dimension operators, go through all these arguments. And so it seems like that I've actually shown you something more powerful than what I've claimed. Because I said here, it seems like it, it's almost this, right? That power counting is always connected to dimensions. So can anyone spot where there was an assumption in what we did that, that actually, where I, in some case, the power counting might not have been related to dimensions? 